Good morning, everyone. A warm welcome to uh, the first of our three online conference talks for the NHSR conference. Uh, my name is Muhammad Albi, your host. I help out with the NHSR community. Uh, and I'm looking forward really to a very interesting and engaging and a wide, stimulating and a wide, range, a wide ranging set of talks. Uh, I hope you'll, you'll also find them uh, in the same way that I've described. Um, our presenters um, will have a 15 minute slot to present. So um, there may be time for questions um, in their slot. So we would encourage you to uh, submit your questions by the Q&A button on your, um, on your Zoom interface. Um, uh, but if there are comments, please do put them in the chat as we're going along uh, and I'll be keeping an eye on both the, the question as well as the, as well as the chat. Uh, obviously, I have to keep to time, um, so that's also a kind of if when if um, if our presenters uh, kind of bear with me, if I uh, I will have to kind of um, be quite rigid about at the fifteen minutes slot. Um, and so, uh, just before I hand over to our speakers, uh, I would just like to encourage everybody who's joined. Uh, of course, we do lots of online work nowadays, and online webinars and workshops and so on. But we also still have the old fashioned uh, in person conference on the 16th and 17th of November at, uh, at Birmingham. So if you go to the website, you can see the details. Anybody who's able to come, or you know of colleagues who'd like to come, it would be nice to have the 3D experience um, as well as the 2D one that we're going to have today. So it is 11 o'clock, it's on the hour. So I'd like to hand over to our first speaker, who is Deb. Deb, can I ask you to take the mic, introduce yourself? And then the floor is yours, thank you. Brilliant, thank you, Mohammed. Yep, good morning, everybody. I'm Dev Sangira. I'm an advanced analyst at Nottingham University Hospitals. And I'm honored to kickstart today's conference with my presentation on PPT automation. So what is PPT automation? Well, it's an R package designed and developed by NUH to automate our internal reporting. It's primarily built upon two existing packages, one is the plot the dots package, which is a SPC plotting tool developed by NHSR. And the second is the officer package, which is a Microsoft Office and R integration tool. So you can basically output your R scripts or outputs as a Word document or a PowerPoint. So combining those together, PowerPoint automation, PPT automation is a SPC plotting tool that produces PowerPoints for our internal reports. And since launch, PPT automation has reduced our reporting time scales by up to 50%. And in certain instances, up to 90%. So that's a significant time, time saving. So why did we develop PPT automation? We recognize SPCs or statistical process charts as a really useful analytical tool. However, to implement those in Excel, they were incredibly time consuming and laborious. We have the making data count tool in Excel, which was really handy, but when you extrapolate that across the hundreds of metrics that we report on and the tens of reports that we have to produce in Excel, that took a lot of valuable time away from our analysts from uh, actually adding value to the reports they produce. And our existing Excel based reports had a lot of inconsistencies in the way that they were formatted and the data connections that they would have. So we couldn't necessarily say there was one source of truth across all these different SPCs. So we recognized that there was a need for a new tool, one that had to meet several different requirements and several different users. So as an analyst myself, I wanted to produce accurate reports, but also in a timely manner. And as an insight manager, I'd want to view performance across my division or specialty. So I'd like a flexibility to look at my data across different views or as a head of business intelligence, I'd want to be able to deliver a consistent product across my, for my stakeholders. So there was a need here to create a new tool, one that is accessible to lots of different user types across lots of different uh, skill sets as well one that had to be uh, had to automate SPC generation and make it a lot more user friendly. Thirdly, the tool needed to bring or have the ability to bring several different data sources together. 
And lastly, it must output as a PowerPoint. And here today at the NHSR conference, I think we can all agree that the best tool to deliver that is of course R. So myself and my colleague, Tom Smith, decided to start what we'd call now PPT automation, which is our R package. And fundamentally, this package is built by mapping data or SPCs to objects within a PowerPoint template. So we have our NUH custom slide master, and we would create R functions for each specific type of slide and map those to the slide. We'd string the slides together to produce a slide deck, a custom slide deck, and that would be our report. I haven't produced a package before, but I found uh, Hadley Wickham's R Packages book to be a really handy guide to producing package. And for those of you who haven't developed a package, I'd highly recommend his book, which is accessible for free on that URL. So Tom and I developed this package using Git uh, as our, to manage our workflow. And in principle, what we did was we created issues for each of the different functions that we wanted to create. Uh, made main branches for those and then reviewed them and merged them into our main branch. And in total, we created around 14 different types of functions. So you can see on the right that we have a function for a four SPC slide. So one where you've got four different SPCs. We've got another one that is for six SPCs and one for a single SPC, an exec summary, a title slide. So lots of different ways, 14 different ways that you could customize your report. So how do you use this package? Well, it's as simple as two steps. The first step is you read in your data to create a data bundle. And then your second step is to create your slide specific function. Sorry, you reference your slide specific functions to create your custom report. So if you have a look on the right, we're calling the PPT automation package in. We're reading in our data, which right now is Excel, but we have uh, plans to pull in our data directly from our C from a SQL table. You pull in your data, create your data bundle, and then you reference the functions for the slides that you'd like to use. So the idea here is to have one single R script that can reproduce reports, every single reporting period. And that can be split or filtered for different specialties or divisions and you avoid the complexity of Excel-based reports where you're copying a report template for each month and you risk losing the integrity of your data if you're making lots of different copies uh, for different users. Whereas in this instance, you have one single R script as a single source of truth that can produce several different types of reports. So let's take a look at one function in particular. This is our four SPC function. So you can see at the top, we've got four different numbers and those are our references for the metrics that we want to plot in our four SPC chart. And here we've got four different charts. Reference one, 10, 11, and 12. They don't have to be numbers. Uh, they could be a combination of characters and numbers. It just has to be a sort of ID for your metric. Some of you may have spotted that the first two charts aren't in fact SPCs. They're just regular line charts. And that's because we've been able to develop this package in a dynamic way so that those metrics that aren't suitable for an SPC are just plotted as a regular line chart. So in this instance, those metrics have less than 12 observations, which doesn't make them suitable for an SPC. And consequently, they're just plotted as a regular line chart. We've also got some additional information as well as the SPC. So we've got a target value if that's populated, our most recent, uh, most recent data, a variance type if that's available, and also an assurance type. And this is completely customizable. So uh, it makes it a lot more flexible for our analysts when they're producing their reports and frees more time for them to actually add value in their analysis. But our package does more than just create SPCs. We've got a template here for a matrix, a three by three matrix. So this is the variance and assurance type for the SPC. And then the, the metrics are plotted within that matrix. Uh, so just for 
information governance, I've blurred the metrics, but you would have the metric title in the part of the table that, that they belong. And this helps our execs to really focus their attention on the metrics that require their attention. And equally, if I zoom in here, we've got an at a glance summary table. So this is our uh, a table of all the metrics and then some key values that provide some more context. So we've got, for instance, a year to date value or the previous three months of data, a target value, as well as the icons that we get in a regular SPC for variation and assurance. And again, this helps our leadership team to look at the metrics that require their attention and make decisions based on that. So just to recap, the PPT automation package is a simple two-step package to reduce uh, our reporting time scores and improve efficiency for SPC production. You call in the packages. So in this case, we've got Tidyverse, Read Excel, and then PPT automation. You read in your data to create a data bundle. And then step two is actually creating your new slide deck. And this is completely customizable by bringing in the functions that you'd like. So in this case, we've got a title slide and we're reporting on family health. Then we've got our at a glance slide. And then we've got our four SPCs with the four IDs for the metrics that we want to report. And lastly, a three by three metric uh, matrix. And then you save your output as a PowerPoint. So it's a very simple uh, reporting package. To date, we've got a working R package that is used across our trust. It's currently a version 0.9, uh, but it has been well received and ac accessible to novice R users. Like I said, it's saved us a significant amount of time. And I've heard anecdotally from one analyst that something that took them three days to produce now takes them two hours. And because it's a single source, of, it's using a single source of truth, we've found that our reporting has improved in its accuracy. Our aim is to complete our version 0 0.1 and make this package open source. We have a couple of stages before we get there, including decoupling our existing NUH um, design from the package so that everybody on the call today can benefit from this package and use it across their trust and benefit from the time saving. Uh, so we we'll really look forward to making this package open source and having you guys uh, use it as well. I hope you guys have taken uh, some value from this presentation or at least been inspired to create your own package. Um, thank you again for your time. If you have any questions, I'm uh, willing to answer them or if you want to contact me on the Slack channel, I'm accessible there as well. Um, Jeff, thank you very much indeed. Uh, Jeff, um, thank you also for keeping to time. We do have a couple of minutes and there are a couple of questions. The one question has is been, um, does it work with custom PowerPoint templates? So currently it's mapped to a particular template. Um, the way that it works is that it's referencing object IDs within a PowerPoint template. So it would be paired with a, a template that comes with the package. Um, that's not to say that um, you couldn't have a look at the source code and amend that yourself if you wanted to use your own template. Uh, there are lots of comments, by the way, lots of people saying that find this interesting, relevant, important, uh, and uh, that people have had a go with it, perhaps found it a bit tricky, but think your solution, uh, the, the solution you and your team have developed, it's great. Uh, there's been a request for possibly the underlying data um, uh, to be made available. Uh, so he says, could you provide the underlying data in parallel for other purposes? But I suspect that there will be some data governance issues, but do you want to just quickly address that? So the package doesn't necessarily rely on any underlying data. It's just a way of presenting the data. Um, so the data, for instance, in this today's presentation was just dummy data, but you could apply the package to any of your your clinical audit data, for instance, like in the question, and present that using the package. It doesn't actually inherently have any data within it. This is one last question. Is it possible to output other types of charts, like bar charts or run charts or other things? Um, so far, it isn't, but we could build that in. 
uh, certainly in as we progress in versions, that could definitely be a possibility. If we find that end users find that useful, yep, that's definitely a possibility. Okay. Can I just suggest that it looks to me that there's lots of interest in um, in producing automating the production of PowerPoint based reports, uh, and maybe if we can take the discussion onto our Slack channel and start a group there, and people can help each other try and kind of navigate this space to take out the kind of uh, the mundaneness of those activities and then free up time to do, as, it, as Deb said, add value to other things. But uh, I'm really excited about what I've heard today, and I would like to write some of this up as a success story for the website. So I, I will be tapping your shoulders to help me do that at some point. <laughs> Absolutely. So thank you very much indeed. Um, so I'm just, uh, so uh, we'll very shortly move to our next speaker. Um, our next speaker is, um, I think it's Inna, if I'm pronouncing it correctly, but Inna will correct me. Uh, Inna is going to talk about abdominal uh, emergencies, surgery versus no surgery. Um, and Inna, can I also ask you please to do, do introduce yourself, say a little bit about how you got into R, uh, and then um, and the floor is yours. So thank you, Inna. Yeah, thank you so much, Mohammed. Can you can you all hear me okay? Dev, could you quickly not? Because you're the only one I can see. Thank you. Um, Great, let me just quickly share my screen. Apologies, everyone. I obviously had technical problems I've never had before this morning. Can you now also see my slides? Perfect, thanks. So yeah, I'm Ina Kostakis. I'm a senior analyst with Portsmouth Hospitals University Trust. And I've been in that position for about two months now. Um, I've actually, I come from an academic background, so for most of my career, I've worked at universities, initially in marine science, where I um, got to go out in the field, do cool things, collect samples and data. So I was much more involved in um, that part of science. And um, luckily, that means I have lots of cool pictures of um, my previous career. Um, but obviously you don't only collect samples and data, you also analyze them. And that's when I started to use MATLAB at the time to um, yeah, produce results of my analysis. And that's when I really got into coding and realized that I enjoyed it a lot, a lot. And so when my um, post came to an end, me and my partner, we decided to relocate to the South Coast because that's where his job was. And I needed to find a new job. And that's when I applied for a postdoc with the Center for Healthcare Modeling and Informatics at the University of Portsmouth. And um, they didn't use MATLAB because it's expensive. Um, so that's when I started to use R and I've been using it for um, about three years now. And it's been a fantastic learning curve. I enjoy it a lot. Um, in comparison, MATLAB is awful and clunky and um, yeah, I'm super grateful and um, happy that I've made the switch. And um, yeah, as it is so often when you work in academia, particularly in research, your positions are, you're on fixed term contracts and your um, job really depends on the next bit of funding coming through. And while I was um, lucky enough for my contract to be extended twice in the summer this year, the funding then came to an end. Um, and I was yet again looking for a new job but I was very, very fortunate because at roughly the same time, the local hospital, their research department was looking for an analyst, um, which kind of means that I was able to continue what I was doing up to that point, just at a different institution, working with very much the same people that I used to work previously. But um, yeah, I finally now have a permanent job, still get to use, work with data, still get to use R, um, and I'm very, very happy and I'm very excited. And I'm going to talk a little bit about, you know, my kind of approach to things and how it is working in academia and working in within the NHS and um, to use analytical tools um, towards the end of my talk. Yeah, so I'm, I, I want to talk about one of the research studies that we did. Um, the brunt of the work was done while I was still at the university. It's the BCAE study. And then, yeah, as I said, I want to talk a little bit about the lessons learned throughout the project, but also just throughout my um, time of using R and um, working with healthcare data. 
So um, BCAE stands for Best Care for Abdominal Emergencies, and it was a one and a half year project that was funded through the NIHR Research for Patient Benefit Program. And obviously, I didn't do the, the work alone. I worked in a, in a team with um, researchers and clinicians from both the local hospital as well as the university. And I wanted to highlight both Caroline Kovacs and Alex Darbisha in particular, who have worked really, really closely with me on this analysis. A little bit of background about what was the, what was the problem that we wanted to address. Um, abdominal emergencies um, is a group of conditions with um, a very, very severe conditions where there is something wrong with a bowel. So um, that could be a perforation, a leak, obstruction, or insufficient blood supply to the bowel. There are also certain infections that can cause abdominal emergencies. And it quite often means that patients are admitted to hospital with severe pain in their abdomen. Quite often, they're not able to you know, really think or realize what's going on around them because they're really seriously sick. And um, typically, this kind of condition has to be treated with um, emergency surgery. And traditionally, that's been done um, through open surgery, so an open approach where there's a, a large incision made into the um, abdominal cavity. And it's actually not that uncommon. There are about 30,000 of these procedures in England and Wales every year. The problem is that um, they are really life-threatening. There's a very high mortality risk associated with this kind of procedure, which is partially because the underlying condition is um, so severe, but also um, because it's, it's, it's really a major operation. Um, open surgery on your bowel um, it introduces like quite a trauma to the body. And the, um, yeah, as I said, has a very high mortality rate, much, much higher than any cardiovascular surgery or anything. And um, that the risks associated with this procedure and this condition are quite high was recognized about 10 years ago when the National Emergency Laparotomy Audit was founded, or short NELA, and they've been monitoring the standards of care for these patients. So they risk stratify patients and then say, for example, for high-risk patients, we need both a consultant anesthetist and a consultant surgeon um, in theater at the time, as well as they do need an ICU bed afterwards, these kind of things. Problematically, though, not all patients that have an abdominal emergency actually end up having surgery. Um, there's only been a, one small study to date on about 300 patients, and that showed that about a third of patients do not have surgery. But in that study, um, that group has a significantly higher mortality rate of over 60%. Um, and so the, pro like the problem is that we don't know a lot about these patients. Um, and that there is a bit of a worry that they might fall through the cracks because once they, the decision was made not to operate on them, which can have been made for many reasons, either the patient didn't want it, the surgeon thought it was too risky to operate or at least to operate in that moment. Um, there was concern that then they might not receive the best care because, for example, the standards that are imposed by NELA suddenly don't apply to them anymore. And so we set out in our study to look at a little bit under a broader umbrella to look at all patients with an abdominal emergency, not only the ones that have surgery, which are also recorded within the NELA audit, but as, as, as we said, to, of all, to look at all patients that were admitted with an abdominal emergency to Portsmouth Hospital. And in particular, we wanted to compare outcomes for three treatment groups. So the patients that had open surgery, the patients that had less invasive keyhole surgery or laparoscopic surgery, and then the ones that didn't receive any surgical treatment, but might have had radiological drains, antibiotics, pain relief, that kind of stuff. And probably the most challenging part and the most interesting part of the study was getting the data. How do we identify from the clinical systems that routinely collect data on all of our patients when they're admitted to hospital anyway? How do we identify the patients that are relevant for this study? How do we identify the ones that had an abdominal emergency? 
And so the initial thought is obviously to look at Nella, but the problem is Nella only cares, like, I don't mean this in a bad way, but Nella only records data on um, surgical patients, but doesn't record data on the ones that didn't have surgery. So they, they would never include all the patients that we are interested in. However, from the Nella website, we got a list of diagnosis codes that Nella uses to identify the ones that should be entered into, into the audit once they have surgery. So based on that list of diagnosis codes, we did a series of trial extractions from our um, theater management system and looked at if we use all of these codes, how many patients do we identify? Does that match with the kind of volume that our surgical colleagues see? What are the outcome rates? Um, and do we end up with like a cohort of patients that is re representative of what our um, of what the surgeons would expect? And we had to go through quite a few iterations because um, don't know how many of you know that, but um, for any admission to hospital, there can be anywhere between 10 and 100, maybe even more diagnosis codes recorded for that, been, been recorded for that admission. Um, and that means we also, there's a huge amount of noise in the data. Um, and we, through essentially trial and error, an iterative process, we um, realized that we only really identify the patients that we want if we focus on the ones that had a clear surgical diagnosis. So we went with that approach, applied the national opt-out, and um, ended up with 14,000, over 14,000 admissions since 2013 of patients who were admitted to Portsmouth with an abdominal emergency. And once we'd identified these admissions, we could then extract patient demographics and admission data from PASS, um, information on the procedure from the theater management system, as well as information on their vital signs, their blood tests. Um, and then of course, for those patients who were also entered into the national emergency laparotomy audit, we could get audit data, which was a little bit more detailed um, in some respects. So this was our starting data set. But when we did further analysis, we realized that it wasn't necessarily as balanced as we wanted to. For example, the proportion of non-operative patients was much, much, much higher than we expected. I think it was 70% of patients did not have an operation and that's not really um, what we would have expected. So we did some sub-analysis. We really went through individual diagnosis that would be classified or fall under the umbrella of abdominal emergencies um, and checked their outcome rates and what kind of procedures they had and how many procedures they had and that kind of stuff. Um, ag again, against the clinical experience of our colleagues. And using this approach, we then narrowed it down to a final analysis cohort of just under 4,000 admissions, which we then split in the three treatment groups that I've already mentioned. And on this slide, you can just see a breakdown of the three treatment groups there, you know, key patient demographics, as well as some of the admission information. Um, interestingly, there is, you can see the largest group were actually the non-operative patients, um, but even laparoscopic patients were, there were more of them than the ones having open surgery. And I should point out at this moment that Portsmouth Hospitals is actually a leading center for laparoscopic surgery and has much higher rates of um, keyhole surgery than compared to other centers. What did we find when we actually looked at the outcomes? So as you can see in the, the middle bar, it's the laparoscopic surgery. And you can see that the mortality rate for those having keyhole surgery was significantly lower um, compared to the other two treatment groups. And that's exactly the reason why Portsmouth Hospital is using so much laparoscopic um, surgery, even for emergency surgeries, um, because they find that generally outcomes have been better um, when using this approach. Um, the other interesting fact was that mortality rate for the other two groups wasn't actually that different, which is in stark contrast to the study I mentioned earlier that found that the non-operative group um, might have significantly higher mortality 
Um, of course, the results are also determined by our patient selection, and um, we recognize that with our approach, we might have identified a slightly different patient group than, um, than in the Glasgow study I mentioned earlier. Um, however, we do think that we used a very robust approach, um, and therefore these, interest, uh, these findings are really interesting. I'm actually going to, in the interest of time, I'm going to skip over this. This graph just shows that patients having open surgery have generally the longest um, stays in hospital um, with laparoscopic surgery. Patients having shorter stays in hospital and the non-operative group generally has the shortest um, hospital admission times. We also wanted to look at whether there are differences between the groups, not only between the different treatment groups, not only in terms of patient demographics, but maybe also in terms of how sick are they when they come to hospital. And um, we used the National Early Warning Score or NEWS to measure how unwell the patient was. So the National Early Warning Score combines a series of vital sign measurements to express unwellness essentially. And the news of zero is you have normal physiology, normal vital signs. And then the higher the news, the more sick the patient is. Um, and interestingly, we found that you for patients, sorry. Yeah, thanks. Um, I'm, I'll be wrapping up really quickly. Um, yeah, in one sentence, patients that didn't have surgery and were admitted really, really with a high news of four or higher they were said they were found to have significantly higher mortality and that's something that was really interesting for our surgical colleagues because um, because there's a suggestion that maybe some of these patients would have actually done better if they had surgery so we need to look more closely into that I'm not going to summarize everything again what I've already said um, this was the first time this project that I've actually worked with other people on developing a piece of code and I found it extremely challenging. Um, normally it's my code, it's exactly written in the same, in the way that I want. The variables are exactly named the way I want. Um, and I did find it noticed that I did find it difficult to let go a little bit. And as long as the code worked, why not go with, with it in the exact same way that someone else um, had written it? I um, obviously this was also the first time I really used GitHub, which I thought was um, was what really a lifesaver, and we couldn't have done it without using these tools. And it just showed me why why these tools have been developed and why they're there for a reason. So for any sort of collaborative work, collaborative analysis, collaborative coding, GitHub is the way to go. Um, because we do a lot of repetitive analysis, looking at you know splitting a data set into different subgroups and then running the same analysis on these subgroups um, using functions and the per package to just automate these repetitive tasks has been extremely helpful, saved a lot of time. And um, yeah, I, I think I have to apologize that I haven't actually included any R code in my presentation, but that was because I realized that the analysis itself was maybe not the interesting bit, but the way we dealt with identifying the bit of data that we want from routinely collected data and our clinical systems was maybe the interesting bit, which is why I wanted to focus on that um, in this talk. And I think I'll just leave it here. Well, thank you so much indeed. Uh, and I think lots of interesting, uh, you know, the, the question is also very important, the insight about the whole surgery. I think it's also really fascinating. And then all the technical stuff that you've summarized on this slide. Uh, especially on um, reproducible analytical pipelines. So thank you for touching all of those bases for us. Uh, and, uh, and a round of applause for lots of people. Thank you. Uh, can I move on to our next speaker, please? It's Joseph. So, Joseph, I'll hand over to you straight away. And um, yes, so take the floor, please. Thank you. Thank you. Good, um, good morning, everyone. I should share my, uh, my slides. Okay, so uh, yeah, good morning and thank you very much for having me to uh, to present today. So my name is Joe Lillington. Um, I'm one of the data scientists working in the NHS Health Economics Unit. Um, today my talk's going to be all about 
a current project that we've recently started. It's on gambling harm. And specifically, we're doing what's called demand and capacity modeling for the population experiencing gambling harm. Before um, that, just one quick slide on who I work for. We're a consultancy um, based within the Midlands and Lancashire CSU, so Commissioning Support Unit. Uh, we work as a consultancy, so we have a wide range of projects across data analytics and health economics. Um, and these are just some of the example projects that we currently have done or are doing or will be doing in the future. So, you know, if, please get in touch um, at the end. I'll, I'll leave my email address as well. But today's talk, it's all about gambling harm. And really the motivation for this project is that is this question, how prevalent is gambling harm? And different data sources have very different estimates on this. Some, some data sources say about 0.7% of the population experience gambling harm. Some say it's more closer to 3%. But the sort of key thing is that with, with those people experiencing gambling harm, it's very hard to estimate those in need but those not interacting with any services, as is true with every sort of mental health um, illness. Um, and we don't know because for a number of reasons. One is that people experiencing gambling harm feel shame, so they often do not approach the healthcare system. They may be in denial. They, of course, it's, it's not a physical illness in itself, so it can be hard to recognize. Um, gambling itself is very easy to do. Um, we can all download the apps very easily on a phone and we can go to betting shops down the road we can go on to websites and and within two minutes be be placing sort of fixed as fixed odds bets and of course there's there's definitely an impact of recent years and some uncertainty on on this so the impact of covid increasingly difficult times really sort of driving uncertainty in the in the demand and research there was definitely or there is definitely a feeling that certain events in the future might trigger or exacerbate the problems so for example one of the scenarios we'll be modeling is the influence of the world cup um, this year so there are a number of aims with this project um, one is to understand the demand based on the support and treatment services um, from the population experiencing gambling harm across great britain on the, on the flip side, we want to understand what is the supply of the services. Um, so what is the support and treatment available? And but really the fundamental thing is we want to understand the balance between the two. So what's the balance between demand and the supply? Is there an oversupply? Is there an undersupply of, of treatment services? And this is all in the presence of various other information. So information on demographics, information on how gamblers are actually gambling. So are they using, you know, are they betting on horses? Are they betting in the casino? Information on their referrals and information on their, the, the appointments, the treatment they have. And we have a number of, of various different outputs that, we're, that we will be producing in this model. So we were interested in sort of numbers of people, numbers of gamblers, numbers of referrals and numbers of appointments. But if we're talking about sort of a demand capacity modeling, we're also interested in, in economics. So we'll be incorporating financial information here, as well as staffing information. And there are various other outputs, more sort of specific to gambling itself, um, but I won't touch upon them here. So in terms of data in this project, really there are a number of sources of data, but there's, there's no perfect one. So it's a good example of a study that tries to incorporate different sources of data, each of which will have limitations in their own right. And we've got data from the, the treatment services across Great Britain. So these are called the National Gambling Treatment Services um, supported by GamblerWare. We have data taken from having surveyed the general population. So this is called YouGov, from, established by YouGov. Um, and we have various other small um, I mean, the first real sort of thing to address with this project is really understanding the pathway. So that is really understanding how do gamblers um, 
go through the referral and appointment system. And this can be very complex and each gambler can follow a different trajectory. And as part of this, we're incorporating various information. So we have information on the demographics um, of the population. So their age, their gender, their ethnicity, et cetera. We have information on the history of gamblers. So which activities are they primarily betting on? We have information on referral. So that could be how are they referred into, into healthcare support and treatment services? Do the people you know, accept that referral? Perhaps they do, perhaps they don't. Um, what's the end reason for the referral? So do they complete their treatments or are they referred elsewhere or do they drop out? And we have various other information about the appointments they have. So are they undergoing maybe face-to-face -face appointments or are they on by telephone? Are they in person? Um, are they individual or are they in more of a group setting? So we have lots of variables and one of the first things we've really just been doing is just to do some sort of simple analysis. You know, classical things we would do in data science, we graph lots of variables. Um, so this is an example graph of the service users across Great Britain. And you can see here that most service users um, are from London or the Northwest, perhaps to be expected. Um, we can look at service users by their intervention, and this, this shows that most of them have what are called structural psychosocial interventions. Um, and we can look at the fraction across different interventions and many other results. So we can look at, we can see that most, um, most people have telephone appointments. Most, um, most um, of these complete their treatment actually, only a small, smaller fraction drop out. But sort of simple analysis in itself isn't, isn't quite enough for this project. And one of the big things we're doing is we're doing what's called process mining and we're using R for this. And process mining is all about a sort of data-driven technique for finding your pathway. And I've shown an example pathway um, on the right here. So this might be gamblers broken down as a function of whether they're from the city or whether they're from a rural region and then a further breakdown of if they have face-to-face -face appointments or if it's more online. For process mining in, in R or in any other language, um, we need three things. We need to understand who are the service users. We need to understand what are their activities. An activity might be, um, if it was a, an, an inpatient um, admission, it might be to do with like an imaging technique, like an MRI scan. And of course, we need to know when do these events happen. And of course, not every activity has time intrinsically built into it. So we might have to artificially put in some time. But, and we're using a particular R package here called Bupa. And if you're interested, you can look this up. It's a very well-known um, package in R um, and in process mining. So we end up with, having done process mining and we can establish a sort of very complicated um, breakdown of the pathway. And what, I'm, what I want to show here is the sort of benefits of doing process mining. There are many benefits. One is that we get a nice picture that we can show stakeholders and they can sort of validate um, against this more data-driven technique. Of course, it's an objective way of establishing a pathway. So there's no, there's no real subjectiveness um, at least perhaps, perhaps less than, it, than having asked a series of different experts. And some other good techniques, some other good features are that it tells you about missing data. Um, so typically in data science, we deal with missing data at the start. Um, but, but in actual fact, if we do process mining, we can, we can sort of circumvent that until at a later stage and deal with it as and when necessary. So, this is just a breakdown of the, of the population experiencing gambling harm as a function of lots of different layers. So their gender, age, um, where they come from, if or not they have, if or not they are employed. Um, of course, the, the, the real picture is a lot more complex. And when you get to things like referrals and appointments, 
in hospital or for gambling, you start to have a lot more complicated pathways where you start to have loops and you, and for any given gambler, they can have many referrals for many appointments. So really, you know, this is just, this is still at an early stage, um, but I just wanted to show you how we're using R in this case to really understand the pathway. And of course, these techniques can be transferred across many other healthcare problems. So that's sort of stage one, really understanding the pathway. Stage two is all about doing more model development and, and really trying to incorporate this information into a demand capacity model. And so we are early in this project. Um, we have an early stage pathway, but the next sort of steps really are to validate this pathway by having expert stakeholders, by trying to address any gaps in data that we may have. And for demand capacity modeling, we'll be establishing a set of potential scenarios. So we have our pathway, which is our baseline model, and we'll be establishing a set of, sort of best case, worst case, most likely scenarios to really understand um, you know, the variation from the baseline model. And this can be very useful for the planning of services for, for gambling, sport and treatment. So the stage three, we will be using R, or we're probably using R and R Shiny to develop a, an app. We'll develop this into a tool um, that's, and this is particularly good, I think, because this is, to our knowledge, the first gambling demand capacity study for Great Britain. Um, and we really want this tool, you know, to be updated as the data improves um, with updated knowledge and, and inevitably with changes in society. So for example, as new, new services get introduced or perhaps as changes. We want the tool to be useful for planning purposes. Um, and this is the sort of real aim of this research. But of course, you want the tool to benefit those who are experiencing gambling harm. So I think, you know, I'll, I'll probably stop there, just a you know, quick presentation today. Um, here's my email. If you want to get in touch about this project or any others, then please do. Um, and thank you very much. If you have any questions, that'd be, that'd be great. Okay. Can I ask for our next speaker, please? Um... Our next speaker is uh, Karina Doris. So uh, Karina, over to you, please. Thank you. All right. Um, I, the, the share screen doesn't seem to appear on mine. <laughs> really sorry. You going me to where the share screen button is it doesn't seem to be appearing on this all right great <laughs> I'll, I'll just say next slide <laughs> that's right thank you all right so today i'm going to talk to you about iterative sequential regression for real-time surveillance of infectious diseases um so my name is karina and i'm a postdoc in a for infectious diseases at the university of oxford and i'm going to do a um co-talk with my colleague pad from uk hsa uh, next slide please um, so at its simplest form, what is the problem? We're trying to model things over time, where we're looking, for example, at something as simple as the percentage of people testing positive for SARS-CoV-2. Next slide, slide please. <laughs> Um, so the simplest answer would be just be, it could just be your standard linear regression where you just try to fit a straight line through it, but you can very quickly see how that will probably fail very often to, to, to have a high enough complexity for the data that you're trying to model. Next, please. So what are some of the possible solutions? So generalized additive models are some of the ones that you might be aware of. Uh, so you can easily implement them in R using the MGCV package. Um, and what they do is they look for smooth changes over the whole time period. You can calculate an instantaneous growth rate by looking at the first derivative. And you can also look at times when changes took place by looking at the second derivative. Um, next slide. 
But what I'm going to talk to you about today is iterative sequential regression, um, which is something that was developed by Irina Shacklow um, in the Modernized Medical Microbiology Group, where they are looking at the surveilling infection severity, and they are looking at a particular example for C. difficile, and there's a paper out there that uh, you can go and read in more detail, but I'll walk you through some of the main points that they were making. Can you just... Yeah, so what the model does is it takes in the data iteratively. So rather than looking at all of the data at once, it will sequentially feed in on the data essentially, and it will compare models with no breakpoints versus the model with one breakpoint, where the one breakpoint can be placed at various different points. Click. Um, so what it does is when when it compares the models with no breakpoints versus the model with one breakpoint, it will look at differences in AIC or BIC, depending on which measure you choose to look at. Um, and if it finds that a difference is significant, where you define what difference you consider significant, um, it will fix that breakpoint. You will have a detection time, so that's how much data did it need in order to find that breakpoint. And then it will keep going in the same fashion. So this breakpoint is fixed. You can no longer look for breakpoints in the past, but going into the future. So again, just click a couple of times through it, please. Um, it will just keep reading in data. It will keep comparing models with this last breakpoint and other extra breakpoints on top of it. Um, and it will just keep adding more data until it finds all of the possible, all of the needed change points essentially, um, and their detection time. So things to note are that you don't need to specify how many breakpoints you have, unless unlike a traditional grid search algorithm, for example. Um, in which you have to first specify the number of breakpoints, and it also had deals with some of the complexity. So if you think about actually allowing for all of the possible number of breakpoints and allowing it to look for all of the possible ones, you can imagine how the complexity of that grows very quickly and it becomes uh, computationally not feasible. So through this iterative way of looking at things, you allow it to still identify as many change points. But one of the disadvantages is that it, it won't necessarily be the best fit to the whole data. It is as it takes in the data sequentially, but this is also because the method itself was developed for real-time sur surveillance of data. So it is really imagining it, running it on data that you feed it in regularly. So you don't want your model in the past to change. It's like once it's fixed it in the past, the model in the past is fixed and it's as you add new, new data, it can only change past that final breakpoint. Can you click a couple more times, please? Um, Humor. <laughs> yeah, so there's a couple of choices to make. So we can choose how close change points can be to each other. We can also choose how quickly change points can be detected when adding new data. So how much data new do you need? And also how confident that a new trend is better than the current trend. And I'll talk you to, uh, talk a bit more about this as we move along. Next slide, please. So why are detection dates useful? Because I think this is one of the big points that ISR has that you can sort of get with gamma as well, but you need to do in some quite a bit of extra work in order to get them. So again, ISR is designed for real-time surveillance, and um, the reason is because it can allow you to actually think about monitoring, monitoring things in real time and thinking about, all right, what is best to survey? So this is a specific example of how it was useful. So here they're looking at surveilling infection severity in C. difficile, and we can look at the, in the top graph, you have morta monitoring mortality within 28 days after a C. diff infection, and in the bottom one, you have neutrophil counts, which are a measure of severity, it's a biomarker. And what you can see is you have a similar breakpoint in both of them, where you can see that there was a, a this, there started to be a decrease in severity, fortunately. Um, and so you have the triangle, which is the actual breakpoint. You have a confidence interval around it, which is not exactly a confidence interval, but all of the breakpoints within that line would give you a model that had a, an AIC or a BIC within the limit that you decided. So they would be essentially equivalent models. But the interesting po point is the plus star, the plus sign, which is in red circles. And you can see that ISR-based severity monitoring would have allowed detection of the severity change, change years earlier than much more mortality monitoring. So if you wanted to monitor C. difficile uh, severity, it's better to monitor neutrophil counts because they're much more sensitive. It may be because it's a continuous count rather than a binary one, or perhaps C. diff infections don't lead as often as you'd think to mortality within 28 days, but they do lead to differences in neutrophil counts. Regardless, it's a good, it's a very useful way to tell, right, this is what's best to monitor. Um, so what are the advantages? It can tell you when the breakpoint could have been detected. The disadvantages is that it can't find the breakpoints within that last minimum distance. You need to tell it, right, you need at least seven days of data, for example, in order to be able to find a breakpoint. So another example where we use ISR 
we are looking at trends in E. coli bloodstream infections. Um, and here we have this split into community, quasi-community, quasi-nosocomial, and nosocomial. So it's split by healthcare exposure from least exposure to most exposure from left to right. Um, and what I want to show you here was one of the advantages compared to GAM is that you actually have the actual incidence rate ratio between any two breakpoints. So if you think about all of these, they're counts. So we've used a Poisson model. So on a log scale, they're just linear lines between every single two breakpoints. On a back transform scale, so where we've exponentiated, we have these slight curvatures that you see in these plots. But you are actually able to say that from 2010 onwards, we have a 10% increase per year, for example, in a community E. coli bloodstream infections. Or looking at a quasi nosocomial case, you can say that from 2010 onwards, there was a stable trend. And you can see that broad from the 95% confidence interval that has one inside it, or from the p value, which is 0 0.65. So all things that you can extra easily extract from ISR. Um, what's the disadvantage? If you can include factor variables as explanatory variables within the package, but it won't look for different breakpoints for each level. So in reality, to get these models where I have different breakpoints, they fitted individual individual models to every single um, group. Next slide, please. <laughs> so one of the most recent papers, which is still a preprint, uh, but I highly recommend reading if you're interested in ISR versus GAM. So the GAM was a generalized additive model to continue the like beautifully smooth changes over time. Um, there's this paper that has just come out where they're looking at the raw percentage of people testing positive in the COVID-19 infection survey. That was a collaboration between ONS um, and the University of Oxford. And on the bottom one, you can see a comparison in between GAM and ISR. So these are looking at cases in London and it's like the blue one is ISR and then the yellow one is GAM. And the main message that I wanted to give is that essentially they're quite similar in terms of the overall fit. Um, but again, ISR gives you some things that GAM doesn't, although you can get them with GAM with a bit of effort. Next slide, please. All right, so hopefully I've sparked your interest uh, and you are interested in actually giving it a try. I will say you probably will have questions. So if you have questions, PED will give you all of the details at the end. Um, but very briefly, how could, how could you use it? It is up on GitHub, it's not in CRAN yet. Um, what you do is you have the zip file, which is the .star.gz, which you can install with the install.packages function in your R script. Um, and then it will just be your package there. What I've added on top is the libraries updating packages function, which is an R script that you can easily call in again, just by using um, sor source brackets and then the R script itself. What that does is it overwrites some of the functions because function libraries such as ggplot and all of that, they've um, changed slightly since ISR was originally written. And I didn't want to change the original package, but rather I wanted to just change them, um, just update some of the functions so that you can have them. The other thing to note is that within the zip file, you have access to all of the functions and you can adjust them as you want to, or you can actually just go and look at them in order to fully understand how it works as well yourself. Next slide, please. So this is just very briefly how it looks. Essentially, there is one function, which is called master.isr, which is the function that you'd want to use that pretty much runs everything you want to. It gives all, it prefers all of the outputs that you could, that you could want. Um, and you have a variety of different parameters. Um, and I'll just walk you through a couple of them. So if you just go to the next slide, please. Um, so the data needs to be provided as a data dot frame. Uh, the, the dates need to be a posi XCT format. And at its simplest, you then also want to have a count variable, for example, so number of something per day, month, year, whatever you want to look at. The model type, what ISR does is it, it pastes all of the different parameters that you give it into a formula, essentially. So anything that looks a bit like your linear model, generalized linear model, quantum regression, that can go in as the model type. The model parameters are anything that comes after. So for GLM, for example, you could have a fam, you, you need to give it a family and perhaps the link. The, minim, the min distance is the minimum distance required to detect a breakpoint. So again, how much data do you want after your breakpoint in order to be confident that you can choose it? The interval length is the minimum distance between two breakpoints. You can tell it, all right, I don't want breakpoints less than seven days apart because I don't think my data will change that often. The interval can be days, weeks, or months. So what that tells us is, is if you tell min distance two, if the interval is days, it will allow for, it will want, only need two days of data if you, give that weeks, it will allow for two weeks of data. If you give that months, it will look for two, it will allow for two months of data at the end, essentially. So it tells it how, what measure, what time measure are you working in really. The criteria, and again, whether you want AIC or BIC to be the, the, the difference that you're looking in when you're comparing models and whether the fit is better or not. And then the criterion difference is 
what difference should we consider significant? So 3.84, for example, corresponds to a p-value of 0 0.05 for a chi-squared test with one degree of freedom, because what you're essentially doing is you're adding one extra parameter when you're adding a breakpoint. So it's looking to see whether that change is significant. I know that's a lot of information, but I'm going to hand over now to my colleague, Pad, who's going to talk you through some of the examples that she's done um, in the at UKHSA on the test and trace data. And if you have any questions, feel free to contact after. <laughs> Thank you very much, Karina. So yeah, that's um, this is me. Hi, I'm Pat. I'm a data scientist and data engineer for UK Health Security Agency. So here I got a few uh, ISSR application and examples of the analysis that I performed during the pandemic. So let's start it with um, why I use ISR. So my objectives of the analysis is not to forecast or predict trends or of the change in case number of cases. However, I would like to provide scientific support evidence that uh, that explain the change of uptick and downtick behavior in my time series data sets. The first one on the left hand side is the daily average cycle threshold values. Cycle threshold or sometimes known as um, refers as CT values is a genomic uh, evidence that used as a proxy for viral load. So in here, uh, it's the continuous, continuous, continuous type of variable, which I started from simple, really putting linear, uh, simple linear regression into fit in, uh, on my data set here. And I, and it gave me that ggplot object, which I can manipulate further using, uh, you know, tidyverse pa um, package to, create some sort of time frames and just to show us that what sorts of uh, policies during that period of time. And moving on to the middle one, that is the hospital admissions using coronavirus dashboard data set. I deal with the cow data here. So my I fit GLM model using Poisson um, model family. So this is one of the good things that that's why I opt for ISR model because I can choose the regression and model family that suit my data sets. On the right hand side is just uh, another example of combined output of two models to visualize and tell a different story. Here the CT values have the inverse relationship with the number of cases. So I combined in, into one plot just to see that, you know, uptick, both upticks actually signal warning uh, messages that if CT value is low, it could indicate the number of COVID cases about to rise. So next slide, please. So more recent uh, example uh, use case of so my research question is uh, can we, uh, how soon can we detect change in COVID-19 hospital admission trend and this come about when e B5 variants emerge in uh, population in um, earlier May this year. Next slide please. So we're starting with uh, two separate data sets here. You can see that on the left hand side is the positivity rate of um, of a COVID testing and the right hand side is the hospital admissions. You can see uh, from this plot that, yeah, sorry, just read the message. You can see here that we try to hypothesize that can we use positivity rate as a, to signal the um, hospital admissions. So uh, in here from glancing on the output, you see that that's two local minimals in, the, in both plots and possibly one local maxima uh, in both plots and arguably the steep that we see in positivity rates probably going to display another um, global and uh, local maxima. We don't, we're not sure about it yet, but we will find out when we explore the mod, uh, model output. Uh, next slide, please. Asik, um, as you can see here that the model, not only uh, we can get um, DG plot output, it's also supported by the data frame. The information in a data frame tells us a lot of things. So for example, the um, CI, left CI and right CI is confidence, 95% confidence interval for each breakpoint that the model gave. Can you tick, can you click once please? 
Yeah, you see on the first break points, it's identified as the 26th of May. In the column, this is a very important information. When notice, it's basically the date the model gave us when that breakpoint was first detected. And it's if my calculation is right, it's about eight days after the first breakpoint. You can uh, see the horizontal bar. Sorry, uh, uh, Ped, I'm I'm going to have to ask you to come to a close if you don't mind. Sure. Please, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. I, I got that 30 seconds. I, I'll do it as fast as I could. Thank you very much. So we can see the um, breakpoint that in horizontal bar that describe the uncertainty. And in the data frame on the right hand side, we got a p value as well. So if you go to the next slide, please. So we can use the two outputs and then um, cross, uh, cross reference each other and see how that links to each other. So next slide, please. Next slide, please. So in, to sum up, um, ISR just have, uh, it, it's not on, on CRAN yet, and I would like to take this opportunity to call for collaboration. If anyone would like to um, make this into a package on CRAN together, please reach out to me on the email tier. And thank you, Karina, very much for your time to explaining ISR uh, algorithm under the hood. So yeah, that's, that's it from us. <laughs> thank you, thank you, Ped. Thank you, Karina. I, I think there'd be lots of interest on using the package in the real world. So also a plea really to offer some training workshops for the NSSR community. Uh, without further ado, then I'd like to pass on to Mark, please. Mark, if you just take the floor and um, I, I, we'll give you your full 15 minutes, Mark. So be relaxed, thank you. Sorry, just realized I was on mute there. Uh, yeah, so I'm just going to share my uh, screen one second. Yeah, this one. Can everybody hear me all right? Right. Um, yeah, so uh, this talk is based on a little app uh, that, that I produced, um, which uh, sort of like maps. Uh, all the surgery waiting times and so on in the, uh, the London boroughs. So it's not going to be focused on Shiny, but it's more just about using the uh, leaflet, which is the package uh, that, that the map's created with. Uh, right, I do, I, hopefully that's in presentation mode. Yeah, right. So, uh, yeah, so that that just showed you is used by the commissioners of uh, dental surgery contracts in uh, in London. Um, they basically just wanted to to be able to see easily their various like statistics for the the different uh, boroughs and the contractors in those boroughs. Um, the so it's all like uh, open codes. So you, you can find uh, the the code to, to run the dashboard, including the example data, which is just like randomized data. So it doesn't actually represent, you know, the real values in there. Um, but yeah, so like uh, on, on to the actual coding bit of it. So um, the, the reason there to use a map uh, for data visualization, it, it's, it makes it a lot easier. And it's like, when, when you've got like uh, geographical data, you really should use a map because, for example, if you want to know um, if there's any sort of geographical pattern and you just get a table like this one, uh, you, you can't easily sort of say, you know, like uh, that that, the, uh, that there's the particular part of like London, which is um, got like lower or higher waiting times. So even though you can do things like ordering and so on, you, you can see the lowest waiting times are these, but where are these boroughs in relation to each other? Um, but then, obviously, with a map, uh, you can see straight away that, that you've got, you know, markedly lower waiting times across this this uh, north to west border here. Um, and basically, yeah, that's exactly what a map's for. So if you've got that information and it actually helps and gives some insight, um, there's no reason not to use it. Uh, and it's actually pretty easy, as I'll, as I'll show you um, uh, going through this. But yeah, uh, the, the Cambridge Dictionary just... 
one definition of a map is a drawing that gives you a particular type of information about a particular area, uh, which is, you know, aptly uh, shown here. So uh, Leaflet, it, it's a JavaScript library, um, and luckily it's been ported into R, so uh, there's a, an R package called uh, the same name, Leaflet, um, and you can see lots of examples on using it. Um, you know, you can do all sorts of things, um, like even have like custom graphics and stuff like that. Um, so when you're doing a, like a maps and stuff using Leaflet, you need to use uh, GIS files, which is um, geographic information system files. Uh, the way Leaflet works is, is it combines layers uh, together. So you'll have like a base map, which might just be provided by the Ordnance Survey, for example. Um, and then you get layers where you can layer on top of it polygons, lines, points, um, custom graphics, um, and like tool tips and stuff like that. So uh, the, there's actually like quite a few different types of GIS data. Um, the one that I've used is, uh, is what's known as shapefiles. Uh, and shapefiles are really just um, like descriptions of like vectors. So it can be like points, lines, and polygons. And then you create the borders up by lots of straight lines. So even though the, the borders can like curve and so on, if you do like very sort of close together points, you end up with uh, something that, that doesn't look straight, even though it's just made up of straight points. Um, the first thing uh, that then is to actually read that data in. So using the, uh, uh, a package called RGDAL. Um, I didn't actually put that there, but yeah. So uh, you need to library in RGDAL, uh, and then this exposes the function read or GR. You can then just point it to where the data is, uh, and you tell it which, uh, which layer to, to load in. So the, the information uh, for this particular shapefile, et cetera, it's spread across uh, multiple files. Um, but just specifying the, the layer, it then reads in all these and creates the, the layers um, as defined in here. Uh, and also like additional data and stuff go, uh, gets added to it. Um, when you run this, it does come up with a lot of warnings um, about like things known as discarded datums, which uh, to be honest, I'm not exactly sure what they are, but uh, yeah, if you don't want to say that, you can just press warnings. Um, so the, the structure of uh, the, the data itself, it, it's a special type of data frame known as a spatial polygons data frame. And you can inspect some of the, uh, the details of it. So using the, you know, the structure uh, argument, if you do a uh, structure just on boroughs, it, it, it'll sort of show you so much information, it'll disappear off the screen. It'll take like 10 seconds to display the data. There's so much data in there. So um, if you just want to have a quick look at the, the sort of top levels, you can set the, the max level there uh, appropriately. So if you set the two, you'll just see like the top level. Um, and each of these like uh, at signs, so you've got like at data, at polygons, they're what's known as um, slots in this spatial polygons data frame. So uh, the, the data slot, uh, that's just the traditional data frame. Uh, and that's the one that we're going to be um, sort of concerned with, with using uh, to add data into it that you want to show on the map. Uh, the rest of it can just be, be left unchanged. So when it comes to modifying it, um, we can inspect what, what the current uh, data is in there. Um, and you access these slots just by doing, you know, at data. Um, so you, you've got your Burroughs object, which you've read all that data in, and you just go at data. So then uh, using the structure argument, you can see the, the column names in the data frame. Um, so in this one, you see, for example, you've got the name, which is the name of the borough. Um, and then you've got various other information. But now all of this other information you don't actually uh, need. So it's like a good idea just to get rid of it, really. Um, so you can do that easily enough. You can treat the, you can do like, um, modifications of the data frame just as you normally would and then assign it back to the boroughs at data. So uh, here all we do is we just transmute it and change the name to, to borough which is what it's going to be called in the data that we join later on. Um, 
So another thing is, uh, so there's, there's quite a few different standards um, for how geographical data, um, it, how the coordinates are given. Um, so the, the Global Positioning System, or GPS, uh, that's the system uh, that, that's used in this one. So it's simple enough to transform it. Um, the hardest thing is finding out the exact code, um, but there's lots of places you can find that. It's quite easy to Google and find the codes you need. Uh, and what this is doing, it's basically just changing the coordinate system into GPS coordinates. Um, another thing, of course, is when you plot in the map, you need to sort of specify where whereabouts do you want that map to be. Um, so you can get the bounds uh, of the boroughs by uh, accessing the, the at BB box uh, uh, slot, which uh, is basically just like a, a small matrix. Um, and this just gives the coordinates there. And later on, you can send her uh, based on that so that um, when you open the map up, it's right, you know, it's got the, the place that you're interested in uh, focused. So the next thing that we'd uh, like to do is to, to join the data that you want to actually show like additionally, in addition, you know, um, this is not the geographic data, this is more the, the data about each borough itself. So we've uh, got a, a small data frame, which just has the borough name. Uh, it has this lot num, uh, which is kind of like a contractor number. Um, and in this one, I've, I've just got a single column, which is average weight. You can have multiple things and, and show lots of different things like on the app, which I'll show again at the end there. Uh, so, so this data is merged into the data slot of boroughs. Um, one thing to note though is that when you modify the data slot, you, you need to make sure that you don't um, change the order of the rows because th that will sort of uh, mess up the, uh, the relationships between the polygons. So it, looking again at the structure, uh, this, this this uh, polygons list of 33 boroughs, uh, it's got a specific order. So if uh, the names in the data are changed, uh, then you'll get the wrong names uh, for being associated with the, the polygons. So it might show you like Ealing is down in the, the, the southwest, uh, sorry, southeast even, rather than where it should be in uh, the northwest. Um, so yeah, um, SP, uh, which is, library in when you do the argue dal uh, it's got a special uh, merge function which is like a safe way of doing it so you can just specify uh, sp colon colon merge and then you can merge uh, that for with data so because the, uh, the we changed the data uh, column name to be borough and it matches that then it'll just automatically uh, join based on that um so so actually creating the the, the, the map itself uh, using leaflet so you call leaflet just by you know using the the, the, the leaflet uh, function. You you pass in uh, the data, which is uh, the whole sort of data thing with all of the the polygons and so on. So that's that's your uh, spatial polygon data term. Uh, you can just specify a height as well if you want. So um, at present, Burroughs is not used, but we'll use this later on. But uh, this is just to get the the basic map up. So this is like the first layer that you're using. Um, and then, as I mentioned before, about setting the, 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 the bounds of it, you can set the view just by calling the, this set view function. Uh, and to, set, to, to center in those, you can just set it to the, so like the X and the Y, the latitude and longitude is going to be the mean of the bounds. Uh, and, and you can also set a zoom level. So um, you'll see like when, when you load the map in, um, you can find like the best zoom level so that you, you get as much of the the sort of area on, on, on screen as you, as you can without like hiding any. Um, so that's just like trial and error. Um, so one thing that you might want to do is to, to have like some sort of shading uh, of the borough to, to like indicate like um, how high or low something is uh, relatively. So to do that, you can create uh, various color palettes. So you, you do this using um so, so color numeric is a built in. Um and here we're using like a yellow green um uh, palette. Uh, and the the sort of like uh, the scaling, you, you can pass in that borough's uh, data uh and you're using the, the average weight. So you, it'll basically scale it based on the average weight. Um 
when when it comes to NA values, um, so if you have got any NA values in there, uh, it doesn't look right on the legend. So you can define like a separate one for the legend where you just add in this NA color, uh, and it basically just hides it by setting it to uh, the alpha to zero, so it's like invisible. Um, so now, uh, if we wanted to, to add a layer to the map, including that uh, color scale and so on. So we've already saved in this London map uh, just here. And um, so now we can just assign that London map um, to itself with some like further modifications or layers added. So th this layer is uh, adding a polygon layer. Uh, and we're setting the, the fill color um, to, to that PAL map based on the average weight. Uh, and the, the opacity as well. So usually you'll want it to be, you know, a little bit less than one so that you can see the the, uh, the map uh, underneath it as well. Uh, and then the, the legend's added. So this one's using the, the color uh, scaling for the, the legend that we defined. So uh, if there had been any NAs in here and we hadn't uh, set like uh, that, NA, that NA to be hidden, it would kind of, um, added something like there or, or maybe it's here and it would just look, wouldn't look right. Um, but yeah, using the, the special one there, you can get it to show up quite nicely. Um, so at the minute there, this when you hover over it, this won't give you any information. So you can add some, uh, do some further things. Uh, one of which is as well as to, if you want to, uh, to give some attribution for the data used, you can uh, do that. Where is it? Uh, it looks like, sorry, yeah, I've, I've forgotten to include the code in for that, but um, I can show you in a second. Yeah, so you do that just by using um, add tiles and then you can uh, specify this attribution argument. Um, so yeah, that just puts that in. Um, oops. And you can also uh, adjust the polygon properties and add labels. So that doesn't look particularly uh, great by uh, using the default uh, options for the for the the borders and so on for the polygons. So you can specify uh, things like uh, the color of them, uh, the styles. So you can have like dashed arrays. Um, and it just kind of uh, blends in a bit better. Um, when you specify the, the labels as well, uh, that'll create uh, tool tips. So all we're doing here is we're just um, using the, the, the glue uh, package. Um, and then you can just pass in the, the various data uh, fields and just create like, um, you know, like some HTML to display that label nicely. Um, what this will do is uh, it'll create a vector um, so you just need to do this like L apply. Um, so it splits it into the H HTML uh, for each of them. If you try to do HTML sort of of the whole thing, then it means that every label will just show like all the labels, like in one massive label. So uh, just make sure to do it afterwards uh, using L apply. Uh, yeah, that's, uh, that's the slides basically. So I'll just go and um, show you. Uh, the app when you so yeah being um being R you know you can combine all of this in uh oops one second yeah having problems there yeah so you can uh, combine all of this um with using shiny as well so you can do things like um you know you have multiple uh, attributes that you want to filter on um so that you can see it's kind of like a, a concise way of being able to use the same map and just uh, show all of them. Uh, one thing that you can do when you're using R is uh, you can do like a, what's known as a leaflet proxy. So you you specify the base map and then you can like modify with, without actually redrawing everything from the start. So it makes it uh, quick to run and so on. Um, another thing you can do, which hasn't yet uh, been done in this app, is um, using the, the crosstalk pair package. So you can you could do things like where clicking on a row in this table would then bring up the tooltip in the corresponding uh, one there, or maybe it's just like sort of highlighted or something like that. Um, 
and of course you can also have like separate uh, data sets which you can switch between so uh, for this one you have like a separate uh, data sets for endodontics and for IMOS um, surgery as well um, that's, that's great Mark thank you so much I'm got, yeah. um, there's lots of interest by the way and I'm sure lots of people would want to follow up with you uh, just a plea really that I think the community would really welcome an um, a workshop on how you on introduction to to GIS uh, and so if that's something that our GIS colleagues can think about there is one question before I hand over to our next speaker lots of ways of doing maps is one of the points that's been made um, uh, you can use R you can use T uh, oh, sorry T map GG plot um, uh, and do you have any uh, your favorites or yours and and kind of for heat maps if there's any particularly recommended package for heat maps. Uh, I'm still pretty much a beginner with this. This is the first time that I that I use their GIS, um, and it's I mean it's quite a simple use of it. Uh, but I would say that um, Leaflet itself it seems to be very customizable. So, okay. I mean, I was able to do this with just like BSR functions, like the color palettes and stuff. Um, so, That's yeah, great, I, mean, I think okay. you can do pretty much what you whatever you want with this, yeah. You make it sound easy, which is always nice to know. Thank you very much indeed. I'll hand over to our next speaker now, please. So, Dr. Mohammed Faisal. So, Mohammed, over to you, please. Uh, every, all the speakers will get their 15 minutes, please. So, don't rush. Thank you. Um, yeah, I can share the. Can, uh, can you confirm that you can see the slides and hear? You can hear okay. you, Muhammad, but we can't see the slides. All right. Okay. At least uh, not in full presentation mode. Uh, WTV can do the screen slide share. Oh, you've done it, Mohammed. Okay. Oh, WTV is doing it. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, all right. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. So uh, I'm Mohammed Faisal. I'm a, a senior research fellow in University of Bradford. So I've been involved with the R is a more than a decade now, really. So I'm doing. Uh, I mean, I use R for various purposes. I've been from the my background is uh, as a background as a statistician, but I've been you know, we're doing a lot of stuff in bioinformatics, genomic side, using the big data and doing the simulations on the like the parallel computing servers, gathering the simulation results. So, so I, although I have been trained as a different, uh, as a computer scientist and as a computational scientist, I've been using a different languages like C++ R and uh, Java and other languages, but the R is one of the, my favorite ones. So I used often for different purpose really. And I frequently I'm the like a user of this. I have one of the co-investigator in the NHS R community, like in initial bit. So I was one of the contributor in there. And I joined the Professor Mohammed team in the one of the research projects that was our developing of the computer at risk score. So today I'm going to share my experience of uh, using the uh, like the R, like uh, how I use the R and to develop and validate these scores, which are like currently in being used in uh, York Hospital and the Scarborough Hospital. So that's uh, that's my journey really in uh, like a seven years time, like the, how I use interact with the R. Can you see the next slide, please? Yeah, so this project has been funded by the Health Foundation in 2014, and it's a, it's a big team. Is it like the uh, combination or like there's a, a, a engagement from the clinical people, like from the different NHS project, NHS sites, and then there are uh, like uh, PPI and qualitative IT people. So it's a multidisciplinary team. And the next slide, please. 
So today I'm going to share like the how I uh, what is the cards and why we need to develop what problem we're trying to address and then the, the work flow of the like the pipeline of developing the uh, risk prediction scores like how how we can actually validate and do some clinical utility of these scores. Next slide, please. So the problem is a like, challenge this grant actually try to address is that the like the that the five percent of the hospitals deaths deaths are actually preventable and then the ten thousand deaths are related to the sepsis which may be a preventable and then the one in ten like people uh, like the the patients hospital patients they suffer from the like the poor quality of care so that's the whole scenario that's the where uh, we try to uh, contribute and to try to use the already available routinely collected data to answer this question or enhance the quality of care for the patient. Next slide, please. So the new score is the one of the is already like the earlier presenter who has already did uh, some introduction. So I give you some uh, because this the whole project is uh, the based on this vital science data and it's a, uh, it was developed in 2012 and recommended by the Royal College of Physicians. And they develop uh, some uh, score which range from zero to 20 and the higher the score means the patient is sick. Uh, and and it, depending on the those uh, sickness profile of the patient, they actually take uh, some actions, either the nurses approach to the consultant, or maybe they call for the outreach team to uh, as a different thresholds, they act on this. The idea is to provide a standardized care. And the idea for the CARS project is based on this news. Next slide, please. It was a the idea was to develop uh, like a score which actually use the vital signs and then along with the vital signs use the routinely blood tests. There are seven blood tests that are routinely uh, available in the routine healthcare data in hospitals. So the idea was to explore the utility of this uh, and to update uh, like a new score in, in into uh, adding more information and explore which one. Either the uh, routinely collected data is already available, and then that can be used to predict the like the mortality or your sepsis. Next slide, please. And uh, and then as uh, the, the new scores and uh, so yeah, so this was de developed on the we use the two sides, and one was for the development, for one for the validation, but then uh, actually the main reason was uh, like uh, the one fourth of the patients they don't have a blood data so then we need to develop a some equation for them and but if they don't have a blood data then we have to develop an equation which using the vital signs and their new score data only and uh, like the one uh, one fourth of the patient they don't have a blood data so next slide please so the two day i gonna present like the as the problem is like they were trying to predict the mortality uh, in hospital mortality really is a binary outcome. So the naturally uh, we'll, we'll see that whether this and start with the exploratory analysis, which is a, like the starting with a box plot is then one of the choice when you are visualizing this type of data. And I, I just see that you can see that there are around like th uh, 13, 14 covariates here. The continuous covariates are actually can visualize by using this plot and see that if, the, if there is a meaningful difference area any difference between these uh, two groups of the patient who discharge alive versus the patient who discharge disease. So, and yeah, next next slide, please. And I use the other like this using the some standard code, but then nowadays we can use a, like the fancy ggplot as well. But the idea is to see that the, whether, is there any non-linearity and what's the relationship of with the outcome. Like this is the, on the y-axis is the observed proportion of the died and then the x-axis is the is a covariate like you can see on the first graph on the top is just showing there is a uh, as you get older as the risk of the uh, proportion of the people died is higher next slide please so the natural choice is like the as we as this we have uh, like a binary outcome the natural choice is the logistic regression and I uh, extensively used the uh, uh, RMS package, which is developed by the Frank Harrell, one of the biostatistician and uh, lead in this project. I mean, the, in this whole, uh, one of the lead of the, like the, uh, developing this R package and they have the, uh, like the book as well. I will show the, I will share at the end of the, what is the regression modeling strategy book. And next slide, please. 
So I came to the, this uh, only the standard, the one argument could be like, why not you use the modern, like the machine learning algorithm? So I, I, I did a study where I compare this a simple logistic regression analysis with a, a lot of available, like the fancy, like the neural networks, sport vector machines, those methods. And then there are code is also available on the supplementary material of this paper. Where I found that the, uh, the standard logistic regression actually provide uh, for this particular problem uh, or the predicting the mortality, that standard logistic regression with some transformation actually provide uh, similar results when we are externally validating uh, other uh, independent cohorts. Next slide, please. So I use uh, several uh, metrics is to actually to do the like the whether this can be a useful model or is predicting the outcome that we're supposed to do doing uh, and then i use it like the discrimination that is the and then there's popular like the method like in the medical research is the area under the curve rsc statistics so that is one of the uh, popular my year and then we also along with that i would use a, a discrimination slope that is the predictive probability as the the patient with the adverse outcome uh, versus with the patient at the uh, discharge alive so and I, along with that, I also use the calibration, which is the uh, thing like the compulsory as following the Cox framework, like the, how you assess the calibration, the large calibration slope. And there's another score is a Briar scale score, which is the assess both really is a, a discrimination and calibration both. Uh, next slide, please. So the discrimination in the, I, I hope that you already know that, but it's just in the visualization I found useful to explain that it's the area under the curve, and how much the, like the specific predictor or your model can discriminate between the adverse and the without adverse outcomes. Uh, and then if the area under the curve is one, it means it's predicting 100% and it's right answers. If it's 0.5, it's just a coining. Uh, trust, so, so there is no really it's a 50 50 chance so this model is not doing anything next slide please and the other thing is the calibration like the uh, would, uh, like to see that the, if the predicted probability with the observed proportions are aligned on the line as if this is a uh, correct is a it's not deviating really so that is a one of the uh, two performance measures I will use for the whether it's internal validation or external validation. Next slide, please. So I wrote uh, some code which is uh, combining uh, like the different performance measures like Hasmore Lamb show test, prior scale code from the uh, different sources. And then I wrote a one code which can actually use at a handier to get the performance measures and using with the predicted probability and the actual outcome variable. And it can give a box plot and kind of discrimination slopes, area under the curve, and also plot the uh, different uh, predicted probabilities. Next slide, please. So for the modeling, is it the purpose is like the using the different uh, functions, but I there is a some, uh, is it just a summary of this, like the don't do the like the uh, categorizing the continuous variable, try to properly assess the like the missing values assumptions, have a sufficient data, but and then there is a different way of like the using the step AC function is just for the two interactions and the likelihood ratio test. These kind of functions I commonly use this, which is comparing the models and also finding uh, two way interactions uh, out of the, the different uh, covariates model. Next slide, please. Yeah, the main part is like the how I did uh, like the internal and external validation. So, uh, next slide, please. Can I and then I use the or the internal external validation is the most of the studies like they publish in the literature. They only do uh, apparently they do the apparent like the just calculating the data, like the C statistics from your training data set. That's what they do, and then the more than like the, I think there's 70% studies, they do the internal validation steps, which I will show like the, how we can do in like R. And then the external validation is really done like uh, one in four studies or maybe the out of like 100, like 10 in out of 10. And out 10 means out of 100 are uh, really, they do uh, external validation. It be because maybe it's due to the, like the availability of the data, similar data from the independent side. 
I did not really consider. So uh, I will go through the one by one these steps. And next slides, please. For the internal validation, there is a one uh, method that's called based on the bootstrapping. There is a different methods as well, like the uh, cross validation, uh, careful cross validation, leaving one out, or uh, training testing on the splitting the data. But the one of the things that has been used to avoid the overfitting in the model uh, to calculate the optimism is uh, using the bootstrapping and it's keep uh, iterating the algorithm, taking the re with replacement samples and calculate this uh, performance measure, like say C statistics and compare with the original data and find the optimism and then correct the, your result for these samplings. Uh, next slide, please. And in R, we can use this. Uh, is it the one of the? Uh, is it a different? Uh, is it the algorithm that used for the, the same in the RMS package? We can use it to validate and the model, and then the B is the just the iteration number of iteration of the bootstrapping samples, and it's actually give you the calibration and results like the after correcting for the overfitting. And the similar, you can do the uh, apparent like uh, internal validation by using the visualization of the calibration. Like if the model is overfitting, are you underfitting? Are you like how the model is calibrated? So all of these commands are available in uh, RMS. Next slides, please. And uh, the main uh, next thing is the main thing is the, like the uh, external validation, which is really the uh, is a term that used and is uh, nowadays is a necessary step for the, before the model is going to the like the clinical uh, settings, uh, which is a idea is a, like are you getting the same data from the different uh, site, but you don't use this data for any reason for the development of the model whatever you use like the split test and then on the training data set is, is totally different. And there are challenges associated with this, but in technical terms there, what the idea is to actually regress the linear predictors and not the predicted probabilities, but the linear predictors of the logic functions and, and regress on your outcome on a new data set. And then ideally the intercept should be a zero and the slope should be a one. And if it's deviating from this, then it means that there is a, some problem with the uh, external validation. Next slide, please. And there, this is a code that uh, been like adopted from the, this GitHub uh, clinical model prediction models book from the Professor Steiberg. And there's a, there's a code here, then you can use this for correcting this. Uh, uh, either it's a calibration in the large, or your calibration large, or your this calibration slope, both you can use this. And next slide, please. So in in a, in a uh, like a, in a practice, it will look like on the left side is the A is a, a graph A is a basically the internal validation is how it's looked like, and then the B is the when you apply this whole new model into the new data setting, which is look like this not well calibrated due to the maybe the prevalence of the outcome in a different sites. So this it's not really well calibrated, and when you do the recalibration and then you correct for those differences, then its calibration looks good and the graph C. Next slide, please. And, and yeah, so then when you do the some this analysis, this is basically the sensitivity analysis. I, I will share over the like the sensitivity analysis, but the DCN curve analysis is a similar pathway, but there's code for that. But here I will show you that, that what I mean by the sensitivity analysis. Next slide, please. So when we do the uh, this uh, kind of like the modeling, the, but we need to find out whether this uh, because. Uh, in the new score that people use like the different thresholds, like the new score of five, when they actually escalate from the nurses, actually escalate the case to the consultant. And if there is a new score of seven, then they escalate to the outreach team. So what we did is we actually compare this, like the false positive, false negatives, and all other like the positive predictor values, negative predictor values, and the likelihood ratios to actually see like the, how these thresholds are working, like using the standard new score and versus the car score. And how the results look like as the, can you see the next slide, please? And I wrote a function for this to get the, all these uh, six performance measures, but there are plenty of others there, but I did, they will actually accumulate this data into the one row. And then next slide, please. So the whole results will look like the, here's the example of like, I developed the three models like M0, M1, M2, but based using the news and different models, but it's an, you can calculate using those thresholds. You can add that threshold, you can predict the probability, let's say here is the M0 is the 
0.13 is the predicted probability and use this threshold. And then you can see like the, how sensitive this algorithm is. If you see, use the only the M0, which is a base model, and then M1 is a literal improvement, and M2 is a final model, which we use. So you can see the model is improving and then the sensitivity is getting better, but it's more specific, it's less sensitive. So then there is a clinical call, like the how they can use this in a practice, like as it's using the different threshold. Uh, next slide, I think, it's, yeah, this, this is the three main books in this, in, in this area. And the left one is the Professor Schreiber book that is the, actually the start of this book and they have, now they have second edition and there's a, uh, the beauty of these books are they have a lot of R codes are available for each and everything what they do is, and there's a technical things about that. And yeah, then the middle one is the regression modeling strategy, which is a Frank Harrell book, is the RMS packages, and it's a purely dedicated RMS package where they have a survival analysis for the binary outcome and also for the ordinal outcome. And they have a recently, uh, it's a Richard LA is a book, it's published on the prognosis of research, but it's a more about the, like the, uh, it's focused on the impact of those models, how you can figure out the impact. And when you're developing these models, what are the things you need to consider to avoid the biasness and how you avoid, assess the biasness. So now the, the idea in this area is going on, like the people are very, uh, like the provoked to actually do develop the model, but is there is a, lack of external validation and lack of the assessment of the impact in a clinical settings. Yeah. Next slide, please. Thank you very much for listening. So if you have any questions, I'll have to answer. Uh, thank you, Mohammed. Uh, there is some interest and I think people do want to follow up, Mohammed. So uh, um, if you can share your email in the chat, I think that would be helpful. Um, without any further ado, uh, I would like to welcome Zoe, uh, who will talk about creating packages in the NHSR community way. Zoe, over to you, please. I managed to share my screen, but not unmute myself, so I do apologise. Um, I'd like to welcome you to my brief talk on creating packages the NHSR way. My name is Zoe Turner. I'm a data scientist for the CDU data science team, um, which is in Nottinghamshire Healthcare Foundation NHS Trust. And I'm going to start with, it sounds like the beginning of a story, and I guess it always is when you say uh, the beginning of your journey in learning R, packages were built by other people. And it seemed very strange then, does now, to even consider building a package when you're learning R or even when you're well into your journey, because there are so many out there already. But there really is always room for more packages. Um, we can see that on CRAN because numbers keep increasing each year. And whilst quite a lot of these packages are a collection of functions, things that do things, there are packages like our own, which is the NHSR data sets, which I've been really heartened to see um, the use of the news data. So you'll see that data as a data set within um, the uh, NHSR data sets. Um, so some packages hold just data. And this was started in July 2019 with the first commit, which was the length of stay data. Very soon afterwards, um, colleagues added the accident and emergency attendance data. And then I had a chance, and I can't really recall why I did this, but I was really pleased to look back and having had um, given some data to this from the Office of National Statistics, it was data related to the provisional deaths data. It's available already through spreadsheets through the ONS, but they're in wide form, human friendly form. So you read from left to right, each of the spreadsheets is related to each year. And I was looking over several years going back and making it tidy form, so long. And that was the data that in that transform state that I contributed to the NHSR datasets package. That was pre-COVID because there's extra information in there. And also it was being added at that point in 2020. And then in 2021, if people want to pick up some of the news, the national early warning score data, there's synthetic data in this package available through CRAN. So some of the talks today have been around that. I looked through the commit history to get a feel of what it was like at that time when I, I was working backwards, as it were. And it seemed a very smooth process, quite a few commits, but seemed OK. But my overriding um, memory is that I had a lot of help, which doesn't get recorded in those commits. 
I had all the information and the data ready. I'd got the code that I used to transform my data. I'd got the outputs of CSV and R data, um, but there was a lot more to it. And I got help from colleagues in the NHSR community. Looking through the commits, I found that it wasn't just me that was learning though. So I wanted to share this because I thought it was really nice. Chris Maney, I know you're in the audience. I've seen you as well commenting. Um, it looks like you had a few problems with my name, uh, but you persevered getting those two dots. <laughs> There's a, a laughing face there. And it's so nice to see that it wasn't just me learning. I was actually causing a little bit of learning there with my colleague, Chris. Um, Learning takes patience from both the learner side, and we've all been there learning whatever it is, whether it's R or some other languages. But I was so conscious that my colleagues were also giving me a lot of patience in supporting me at that time. They never made me feel like I was asking for too much help or doing something stupid. I didn't know how to get my code onto GitHub. I needed to do pull requests. I didn't know the difference between the readme files. There's MD and RMD. And I got these nice little nudges from my colleagues in NHSR community saying, just do this and just commit that. And this is how you do that. And I felt like I just got through the process without knowing what I was doing, but it worked and my data is out there and it's in this package and it's on CRAN. So it was a safety net that I had, which was the NHSR community around me. If we fast forward to today, um, this po it was the experience that was positive rather than the coding part of things and the learning. It helped me le keep my journey of learning um, to take on an internal package within my own team. I can't share any inf information about that because it takes the data from SQL servers over into R, but um, I hope to be able to share at some point my learning from this. But what I have done is contributed to other packages, so packages and also repositories. And I went through a few of the things and I was listing them all out. And it looks really impressive, but really bear in mind that if you read next to it, these were not large contributions. And a lot of them were about text. They were not really massive amounts of data. And it certainly wasn't about the package as a structure. It was the things around it, documentation, data, or maybe tiny bits of code within it. And if you feel like you want to join in, and there's been a few calls throughout the, the talks today, which is really lovely to hear, um, we can do it also with the NHSR community, the, the community way, as I called it. Um, the existing packages that we've got, the first two listed here, are on CRAN. So we've got NHSR data sets. And you also saw as well in the talk, NHSR plot the dots. There are a few that are still on GitHub, which could go to CRAN or just need developing. They all could do with a... Um, more improvement, you never really stop with packages. NHSR themes and training, population, and there's a universe as well, which we try to build, which is a website where you can bring all the packages together. But it's not just about code. We need designers and artists as well. Um, we've had a discussion recently about the hex logo for the NHSR plot the dots. And the conversation spanned social media from Slack, and GitHub to Twitter even. And a person who's contributed, who has no real experience of R or coding, or even has a GitHub account, has contributed tremendously to the creation of a, a hex logo. And we've just moved conversations and copied them across the different sites so that everybody is aware of what's going on. So it's really lovely that it's the community, not where we communicate, that matters. And you can suggest new ideas or new packages, either through Twitter or Slack or email, or find us in this kind of thing like a conference. If you wanted to contribute to specific issues, you can do a search and this actually gives a link. I don't know if it will share it, it might open up directly. So this is a link in my, my slides to the search, which is for good first issue. That, if you put that generically into GitHub, you can have that across all of GitHub, but this is specifically within the NHSR community repository site. Help Wanted also is another tag that we use. And we try to tag things for people to come along and just do a little bit of a change, some of the text, and it gets you started doing a pull request, commits, um, often getting into a muddle, but having somebody there to help you along. Uh, I still get into a muddle, even though I do try and help people as well. Um, conversations can also just be purely in issues. So this is an, ex uh, an example of discussions about um, cheat sheets. So it started with an issue and then there's some conversations there. Some of these don't turn into, oh, sorry, that wasn't quite right. These are the conversations that come from issues. They don't always result in um, any code change, but it's nice to see the discussions and the views that people have. And it's kind of kept even if it's closed and not really acted upon. 
this was the slide I was talking about, unfortunately, I got it all mixed up, where we can just have conversations that are just an issue. And within our statements on tools, which is a repository, which is our attempt as a community to bring together everybody's experiences of getting things like the free software R, R Studio, um, and Python type of uh, software onto our machines and, and just trying to bring together all our experiences. Uh, there is a, an issue that was raised by Chris Beely for a curriculum for training and learning. If we go to that one, it has various bits of uh, conversation, not relating to any code, but I've been editing one of the particular sections. And I even added today GIS mapping from some of the interesting conversations and the talk that we had earlier, because I think that's something that should be possibly part of a core thing. So you can contribute to those things too. And a final slide before if there are any questions. Uh, the, the NHSR Community Way is about bringing differences of experiences and skills together, and they will change over time. I started out in 2020 having no idea how to contribute to a package, and I went in and just had a go and was supported by the community. And now I I, I'm in a position to help other people in the community. So we all bring our different skills together and that is the NHSR community way. It's not about what you um, know necessarily, it's about the community and helping you learn more and sharing that. And now's the slide for any questions. I've lost everything on my Zoom so I can't see any questions. I... Uh, Zoe, thank you so much. Um, uh, well, uh, I don't know if there's any questions but just to, reassure, just to kind of point out to people that the uh, at the uh, at the last conference I went to, which was the industry conference on R, one of the key presentations was from a from a, a very big pharmaceutical company, and they're just beginning to set up a community of R users in their organisation, and and they were looking to the NHSR community uh, uh, to to kind of learn kind of what we've done, and I just want to under, underscore really the the highlighted word is community, and it is for everyone irrespective of background and newbies, nobies and so on. So please do join in. And, and if you're shy about any of this, you can talk to any one of us uh, offline, really. We, uh, you find us to be very, um, uh, very approachable. Um, so Zoe, thank you. Uh, that's been really, really nice. I actually tweeted how often the training package data sets has now been um, downloaded. So I didn't realize, so we're at 15,000. Um, wow, <laughs> I didn't know um, that myself. Wow. Great. Uh, ben, uh, uh, sorry to keep you delayed, but uh, we'll pass over to you. Please take your full time and over to Ben. Thank you very much. Hi, all. Thanks, Mohammed. Um I'm just looking at my screen at the moment and I can't share it. Um, I haven't got the option to share my screen. So um, it will ask so. WTV perhaps to share and, and you can just call the slides out. Thank you. Awesome, brilliant. Thank you. Um, yeah, so yeah, thanks for thanks for having me. Um, I sorry, just let me grab up my notes. Um, yeah, so thanks for having me. Um, some really interesting talks today, um, and I realised in the last of the day, so I'll try and continue the trend and uh, keep it on a high note. Um, so what I will be doing today is talking uh, talking us through our journey in applying SPCs in the space of a mental health trust, um, but more importantly, how we've used R to do that. Um, so yeah, if you click uh, move on, sorry. There we go. So um, just for a bit of context about me, I joined Hertfordshire County Council midway through COVID, so January 2021, um, during a time of some quite immense pressure on public health. Um, but with that in response was also uh, a period of some quite incredible innovation um, within the team. So I'm in the public health evidence and intelligence team, and some of whom will be presenting in the next week or so. And they were in the process of fully transitioning from Excel to R, and we're rolling out uh, RMD dashboards and shiny applications designed for uh, COVID surveillance and monitoring. Um, so what essentially happened is they've gone through the productionization of R and are now currently using R in a, a non-COVID space, which wasn't the case before. And we were looking to build a community and collaborate with different organisations across Hertfordshire. Um, next slide, please. So off the back of COVID, I joined the performance team at Hertfordshire Partnership University NHS Foundation Trust. Uh, I've only got 15 minutes. I'm going to go with HPFT from now on. Um, and they oversee mental health services uh, across Hertfordshire and parts of Essex. 
Now, the aim of this comment was to encourage collaborative working on projects um, relating to mental health, which has become increasingly important over the last decade, and especially post-COVID. Um, now, along with this, given the links that were established between HPFT and HTC through um, the coding community, a goal of this comment was to upskill colleagues in the, um, the performance team at HPFT in R, um, but also to introduce some techniques to HTC. Now, what we wanted to do was replicate HTC's R in production, um, which has involved training the team on R and essentially aiding the automation um, in a lot of their uh, kind of manual, uh, manually laborious tasks um, from uh, Excel to R. Um, and we've also used collaborative workspaces such as GitLab for project management and version control. Um, so next slide, please. So I, I appreciate, uh, I'm not too sure some people here will probably know what an SPC is all too well. Um, I suspect some of us, some of us won't. Um, so just a quick, quick brief overview. Um, I know we've already had one today. Um, we use SPCs as a tool to measure variation um, in a process um, and is deemed to be a more robust way of indicating whether a process is improving or deteriorating or whether that process can be expected to meet targets or uh, not meet targets over a time period. Um, and we have, uh, for individual data points, triggers associated to them um, to determine whether that specific point will be you know, a cause of concern or potentially a sign of improvement. Now, Making Data Count is the NHS initiative that encouraged this, um, and it's been taken up by trust across the country over the last few years. Um, so next slide, please. So I joined at a time where reporting methods at HPFD were in the uh, kind of process of changing, and the trust deals with a few hundred KPIs, measuring lots of different things. And the performance team have the responsibility of contributing to broader board reports um, on a quarterly basis. Now, the performance team were looking to hop on board with that uh, making data count methodology, which involves moving from RAG based measurements over to statistical process charts. Now, they began doing this using the NHS Analytics Excel tool, which served its purpose, but it, it involved manually inputting every line of data, which would take the performance team of roughly four or five too long to do, and it ate up at the team's capacity during that period. Um, so we suspected R could likely help us, help us with this um, and it was deemed a good project to, to start off with. Uh, so next slide please. Um, so the goal of this project was to take 65 or so KPIs which were used in their quarterly reports and we wanted to create SPCs, create summary, summary tables and provide narrative tables all based off the SPC logic. Now, this, with the aim to like, limit the amount of manual input needed um, into writing the reports and designing tables within the quarterly Word document. Um, now, given the collaborative workspace, HCC would host this product on the server um, so the performance team could access it, um, with the plans in the long run to provide wider HPFT colleagues, including executives and service line leads, with access to the, uh, to the product to monitor state of play on a month-by-month -month basis between reports. Now, the product would be a comprehensive dashboard um, with the idea of using one data frame to provide all the necessary components. Uh, next slide, please. So I, I've probably sounded quite nonchalant about the challenges we face. Now, I won't go into all of them, um, but the main challenge we had was the, the data pipeline and the data quality. Um, so not all KPIs can readily have SP, SPC logic applied to them. Um, in terms of data quality, it's not necessarily the quality of data is bad, but more that some KPIs have low denominators for a given month or might not even have data at all, which would often break SPCs or make it unintelligible. So we had to identify these KPIs first. Now at current time of speaking, we apply SPC processing outside of um, our, uh, our product um, and then we pin it to a server, which we then pull into our dashboard. Um, so another big ask for this, like this product, this application, was to have interactive SPCs um, with the making data count icons. Um, so from an app's perspective, we wanted it, we needed it to be navigable um, with a big drive for interactivity. So we decided on our shiny over a typical RMD flex dashboard or uh, RMD document. Um, next slide, please. Um, so, as we said, the first hurdle we had to overcome was making sure the data is going into the, the application. Um, as we said, we fully apply the SPC process and prior to using it in the application to avoid slowing it down. 
Um, so this is the snippet. We have 65 or so KPIs spanning from the start of 2019 to to today, to this month, um, and we run the XMR process in a data frame that's grouped by um, grouped by KPI. Now, the only information we actually need for this is a numerator, a denominator, um, a, pol a polarity, so whether going up is good or going up is bad, um, and a target if there is any. Um, so my colleague Annie, who runs the charts for our um, NHSR workshop had done some previous uh, interactive SBC work for a different tool, which we'll uh, look at in a little bit. Um, so we, what we needed to do was adapt and build on that code to listen for the typical SBC rules um, that come up in the making data count methodology. Um, so each column of the resulting data frame um, is reflecting um, the whether a rule has been triggered for a given data point. So NAs here are no rule has been triggered so we've got no variation for that data point or in other words common cause um, whereas we've got a consecutive increasing um, and this would indicate that we are increasing the data and it's triggered a consecutive increase of six uh, six or seven plus um, and we need these columns further down the line to be able to provide a narrative and to provide um, uh, the interactivity for the SPC charts and next slide please um, so I won't go too far into the app. Um, I realize it's hard to uh, kind of show the interactivity on a PowerPoint, um, but essentially what we've got here is the, the HP, HPFT executive dashboard, which we've, uh, which we've produced. Um, now on the left, we've got RAG, uh, RAG components, which give an indication of the, uh, the domains for certain KPIs. Um, and upon click, it will bring up uh, KPIs within said group said, said domain. Um, on the right, we have a, a polar chart, and I'm not going to take any credit for this whatsoever. My, my colleague, Gemre, who I'm not too sure is in the call at the moment, um, but he's on the comment with HPFT as well, and he does uh, create this from scratch. Essentially, it's knee charts uh, for our output and made with JS code, because um, no package in R could do this. Um, and it's got the same interactivity as all the other charts in the um, in, in the application. Now on the right of that, we've got um, what we've got the SPC matrix. Um, now, this is the first kind of feature that the um, performance team would use and put in their performance report. So this is all automated. What would normally happen is they'd make a six by six table and then um, fill it in manually, which you know, we, it's too, too much to do when we can automate it with our... Um, next slide, please. So what we have here is upon click of a domain, um, in this case, safe and effective, um, this is what we've got. And so we've got a further breakdown of groups and KPIs. Um, and then upon that click, we have an assurance variation SPC table um, uh, provided uh, with SPC icons for assurance and variation. Um, and then what we also have is um, a narrative table in the bottom right and the interactive SPC chart on the left. Um, so we've got the functions there on the slide as well. Um, so all of these work um, on the pre-processed data frame and deliver the necessary feature. So the, the table, the graph, or the, the summary table. And now all of these are downloadable features in their, in their own rights. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, um, so we fully utilize uh, our Shiny here in terms of navigation and filtering. And the dropdown will react to the group selected uh, above, um, giving us all the KPIs within that group. So we have a description, which is part of the pre-processed data frame, an interactive SPC, and an interactive narrative table. Um, now, uh, for the job at hand, um, we, we did look at using the NHS plot the dots package, um, which is really good, um, but it doesn't have that interactive uh, functionality yet. Um, which would be really good going forward. Um, as I said, my colleague Annie had done some prior work with HPFT um, with a different project, uh, modeling for improvement. Um, so that was the original SPC, uh, SPC chart. What we've done is just adapt the code um, to fit more accordingly to the rules of making data count, um, introducing the aspects of polarity and cause of cause and concern. Next slide, please. So we needed to adapt the function to provide the SPC icons that we find in making data count. Um, although I feel like I've 
been in the group recently and seen that potentially that might have changed. Um, there might have been uh, the icons incorporated now, but I'm not too sure. Um, we have the icons saved in our Shiny app, um, so they can be rendered accordingly depending on the KPI. Um, now, the eCharts package is really useful. Um, for one, it's interactive, um, and there's a lot that it can do. Um, for us in particular, we have hover overs, which provide um, greater context to a specific data point. So I've got it hovered over a data point there, and it's telling me that there's a, a breach uh, in the in the data point under under the lower control limit. Um, now it's really useful for data points which might be triggered for more than one reason. So towards the left with the blue, we might have above the above the upper control limit and part of a group of six above the mean. Um, now it just gives us the wider context, which we wouldn't necessarily necessarily have um, otherwise. Or, or you know, the team would have to go and look, try and find the reason for for that that prob uh, that that special cause. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so we use reactable tables uh, for um, for the summary tables um, as a user can again benefit from the interactive functionality. Um, although this isn't necessarily used by the performance team um, at the moment, the downloadable uh, version is. Um, so it can be downloaded as a flex table within a Word document, uh, meaning, meaning it can be directly incorporated into the, the quarterly reports that they're writing and it, they can be edited as well. So they can have added commentary to it, to it if required. Now, initially we were doing this, we were downloading the images as PNGs, um, which was fairly straightforward, but you you lack the, the editability of said table. Um, and it's also not very accessible to uh, some users. Um, so yes, yeah, so we've changed that and we've, we've used um, a uh, Word document instead for it. Um, next slide, please. I'm not too sure how I'm doing for time. I forgot to stop my watch or start my watch. Um, so I'll, this is my last slide. Um, we're kind of looping back to uh, the the reason we went about doing this project. And in all, it was essentially in order to you know, limit the amount of manual work needed um, when writing and contributing to these quarterly reports. So we're really making use of the buttons or the action buttons and the download handlers and flexible functionality. Um, so the performance team can either you know, download individual graphs, individual tables, or they can download groups of KPIs at a time, which is predominantly what they do. Um, so we can click a button here, and it will provide a flex table with a uh, with the static SPC plot, the narrative table inbuilt into the flex table, so the, almost a child to the mother table, um, which can be edited and read aloud. Um, and this is all in the hope of saving the team time structuring their documents, which is uh, can be quite a pain. Um, so going forward with this, there's a lot of development that we can do. Um, now, I think one of the, the main yeah, the, one of the main purposes of this comment was to to upskill the HPFC team. And Shiny is quite a complex uh, quite a complex coding. Uh, you know, coding method. It could be considered its own type of code. And um, so we've gone about you know, beginning to, to start delivering our shiny um, training and um, the team are already developing apps of their own on a smaller scale to, to, to provide tools, uh, provide tools across the teams. Um, now, what we also are lacking at the moment is that historic narrative, um, which is something that we um, that I'd, we'd like to like to incorporate into this app. Um, but at the end of it all, it's the goal of this was to was to um, free up the team's capacity, and it, it appears to it appears to be doing that. So um, yeah, so that's that's end of my talk. I don't know how I'm doing for time. No, you're doing great. Okay, thanks, Ben. Thank you so much indeed. It's actually an interesting theme that people are finding that uh, by using R, they're managing to save time. Um, the SBC theme also is also very common. And that's great to see. And I think there's huge scope for further collaboration for, across teams with the innovations that people have developed, like the radar plot you described, for example. So I'd like to thank everybody for joining, especially our speakers. And because we are short of time, I'll ask people to follow up separately uh, with our speakers on Slack and so forth. And I think we can now call it a day. So you may all leave, please. Thank you. And we look forward to you joining tomorrow. There are nine uh, nine talks tomorrow and then the day after a similar number. See you all tomorrow, hopefully. Thank you very much indeed.